morning, friends. Uh, on behalf of Philip Capital, uh, it's my pleasure to invite, uh, to uh, welcome all of you this morning uh, to the fourth annual sub specialty chemicals convention uh, that we are doing for our uh, institutional clients. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, all our panelists, which is the first session for the day today. Uh, before we start the entire panel discussion, I thought we will just uh, go over uh, uh, some of the dynamics uh, that we have been all looking at uh, as far as the chemical industry is concerned. So chemical industry is one of the largest industries uh, uh, globally, about four and a half uh, to five trillion dollars in terms of the size. Uh, and there has been a dominant player, China, which occupies as much as about 40% of the market share of the chemical industry. As against China, which has been a dominant player for uh, many, many years, uh, India, as a contrast, occupies or has only about 3% or less than 3% as a market share. So we, you must have seen the, 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 the entire narrative that has been going around as far as, the, uh, uh, as far as the sectoral expectation is concerned over the last couple of years in India. In many, many uh, literature, uh, reports, studies, uh, conversations, you must have come across the, uh, the potential that the Indian chemical industry, and within that chemical industry, perhaps the specialty chemicals, uh, that is expected to deliver a multi-year growth opportunity. Uh, the government of India's own expectation is that it could double by 2025. Uh, I think this entire conversation or dialogue started sometime in 2015 uh, on the back of uh, a regulatory clampdown in China because of the uh, because of the local protest and dissent towards the uh, violation of the environmental pollution norms. I think one of the simplistic views that many of us took was an immediate shift uh, of those manufacturing bases, uh, almost an immediate capturing of market share uh, by market players or the manufacturers uh, such as in India. But it is never so easy, it is never overnight. And one of, the, one of the pointers that we want to share with you is the time that the Chinese manufacturers are taking to comply with the regulatory norms that were put out by the central government in China. So while the guidelines came out in 2015, but even as late as in December 2017 when the central government uh, in China uh, shipped out and thousands of inspectors, hundreds of auditors, and assessed the compliance or the level of compliance is in as many as about hundreds of manufacturing uh, uh, companies in India, the comp uh, in China, the compliance level was still very low. Some of the initial fears in China was the dent that this entire uh, clampdown or shutting down of these manufacturing bases in China would have on the GDP growth. But regardless of or notwithstanding those guidelines, uh, I think the industry or the, uh, the country has still chugged along with a GDP growth of 6, 6.5%. And we hear and we, we have uh, uh, seen uh, the conviction that the government in China is showing towards uh, pressing ahead with the compliance or the regulatory norms. There is greater conviction, there is greater uh, protest uh, for non-compliance, there are penalties that are being put out, uh, there is a deadline that has been uh, specified for small and medium enterprises or medium uh, size manufacturers, the deadline is about 2020 and for the large uh, enterprises it is no later than 2025. So we now see a uh, 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 we now see an opportunity which is actually a multi-year. So once again, we want to point out that uh, the shift, the gradual capturing of market share by the Indian industry is not going to be overnight, but it is already happening. It could happen over the next three, four, five years. It is important for us to keep our ears close to the ground to see in which sectors, for which chemicals, for what products uh, the shift is happening so that one is able to continuously 
keep validating this entire hypothesis about uh, uh, a natural uh, market share gain by Indian manufacturers. Now, in India, uh, you know, the industry itself has been growing. We have seen some of the uh, multi-baggers in the last three years in terms of the uh, sectoral players. The sector itself has been growing very handsomely. Uh, it, is a, it is a sector that has uh, received, uh, 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 you know, keen interest from the institutional investors and non-institutional investors alike. But traditionally, the Indian sector has been very focused on the domestic market. Right? And the domestic market has delivered uh, 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 a, re a growth, uh, you know, a growth number of 10 to 12 percent uh, on the back of a GDP growth of 6 to 7.5 percent that we all keep uh, uh, talking about. I think going forward there will be some changes that we estimate to see uh, within the Indian sector. One is uh, there is an opportunity for the Indian manufacturers to now look outside of India. Therefore, we have to see how much and in which segment or which products uh, we will be able to capture some export share from the global trade. Our share in the global trade is minuscule. Uh, second, I think uh, as against scale, volume, which has always been the mainstay of Chinese manufacturers, uh, Indians, I think, are moving towards uh, uh, slightly high-valued or value-add products, uh, which obviously, because they are niche, because they are specialty, uh, should have a, a better profit margin as far as the product mix is concerned. So product mix, uh, export opportunity, lower base that we are all starting from, uh, a possible, uh, possible continuous multi-year domestic market growth are some of the drivers uh, that should continue to keep this sector in India appealing. And that's, the, uh, and that's the hypothesis that uh, we have put out. Uh, our analyst has been talking about it uh, for some time now. And today's panel discussion will attempt to bring out a similar or the same uh, uh, validation or discussion that we want to bring it out in front of you. The idea and the objective of the panel discussion will be not only talk about uh, uh, you, you know, where the growth opportunities are. Uh, I would be happy if the panel also brings out some of the possible pitfalls, some of the uh, challenges that the Indian companies or sector uh, will continue to face, government in, in initiatives uh, uh, that would provide uh, some kind of impetus. We have seen that in the last three years, the FDI into, FDI into this particular sector has almost uh, moved from 500 million to about one and a half, two billion dollars. So there are some uh, uh, policy level uh, initiatives or uh, uh, impetus that you know, we would like to uh, hear from the panel. I will now move on to introduce uh, our uh, uh, dignitaries who will participate in the panel discussion. Please allow me to introduce them one by one. Uh, we have with us today uh, Mr. Samir Kumar Biswas. He's the Joint Secretary of the Ministry of CNPC. He, uh, he has been uh, part of the Government of India looking after the work of administrative policy and other aspects of chemical and pesticides industry. He's a graduate from IIT Madras and has a postgraduate diploma in public policy and management from IIM Bangalore. He is also an alumni of Goldman School of Public Policy from UC Berkeley. He has more than 23 years of experience as an IAS officer in Maharashtra State. Welcome and thank you very much, Mr. Biswas. We also have with us Mr. Satish Vak. He is the chairman of Chemexil, uh, which was set up by the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India way back in 1963. Double graduate in BSc Chemistry and BA in Economics, and he has more than 35 years of experience in pharma and industry business. Uh, thank you and welcome, uh, Mr. Vak. We have Dr. Kai Flug, uh, a name and a face which is becoming more and more popular in Bombay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kai Flug, for coming once again. Uh, you have been supportive of our initiatives uh, to bring and bridge, uh, you know, the, our understanding of what's going on, uh, uh, you know, with, with our neighbors in China. 
your uh, your engagement as a consultant with the Chinese companies at the strategy level, especially in the chemical industry, is valuable. Some of our uh, clients uh, have had uh, opportunity to interact with you not only in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, meeting, but also uh, uh, during the China visit that they had done uh, a few months ago. Uh, Mr. Kai, Dr. Kai Flug uh, has 16 years of experience in consulting to the chemical industry. Uh, since 2009, he has been the CEO uh, of the consulting firm based out of Shanghai and Hong Kong, married to a beautiful Chinese lady, which keeps him grounded and uh, uh, you know, interested in this part of the geography. Uh, exclusive focus on chemical industry in China has more than 150 papers in journals uh, on this particular subject. Thank you once again. We have with us uh, the president uh, commercial uh, of Atul Limited, Sri Vivek Gadre. Uh, he's a graduate in chemical engineering from IIT Delhi, followed by a PGD ABM from IIM Calcutta. Uh, has more than 31, of exp 31 years of experience uh, in the industry, uh, out of which uh, 29 years is with Atul Group. Uh, he started his career in marketing uh, worked as a SBU head for polymer business and since 2006 he is responsible for procurement and logistics of all businesses of Atul. Thank you Mr. Kadri. We also have with us Sri L. Balakrishnan. He is the Balakrishna. He is the managing director of Brentac Ingredients. Uh, Bentech, he is an MBA, Marketing and MSc Biochemistry from Mysore University. He has a rich experience of 22 years in the field of management and national and international sales and marketing. Before joining Brentech, he has worked with Dollar, Dinesco, IFF and HLL. Uh, Balu, as he is uh, commonly uh, called, joined Brentech as a business head of food business and also held position of general manager, health and nutrition. Thank you, Balu, for coming this uh, morning. The, the moderator uh, today is Sri Amit Gandhi. He's the partner and director with uh, the Boston Consultancy uh, Group, BCG, in India. Uh, he holds a PGDBM from IIM Bangalore and a bachelor's degree in computer science from PES, PES Institute of Technology in Bangalore. Uh, Amit joined the BCG in 2006 and has worked for a year in the Chicago office as part of the firm's ambassador program. He leads the chemical sector for BCG in India. He has extensive experience with clients in India on defining their specialty chemical strategy and the India investment case across specialty chemical se sector. So this is the panel that will, uh, uh, you know, that will uh, bring out uh, some of the pointers that I was referring to earlier. Uh, maybe start the session by inviting uh, uh, Sri Biswas to give his keynote address. Uh, after that, uh, I would request uh, Amit uh, to uh, take over the panel discussion. Mr. Biswas. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to deliver this keynote address today morning. Uh, a, uh, a very, very good morning to all the participants here. Ladies and gentlemen, I am from Government of India in the Department of Chemicals and Petrochemicals. You may not be knowing exactly what the government is doing. Our basic mandate is basically to facilitate the industry for promotion and development. That is a key mandate of the government of India because the investors have to invest in the sector depending on the prom uh, promising uh, return that it uh, really uh, gives in the future. Government is trying to facilitate, remove all bottlenecks and obstacles for the smooth, sustainable growth of the sector. And from that point of view, we do take a lot of initiatives in the form of India came is basically biennial, very big international event for this particular sector. Therein, we invite the global investors, discuss with them the opportunities which are available in India, what facilitation measure the government is taking for them, what are the opportunities and what are the issues that needs to be addressed. And we also do 
hold uh, individual investor summit through Invest India in Government of India. So all these kind of measures are being taken by Government of India. So in that way, there is a great synergy between the conference today of the investors which is being organized by Philip Capital and the goal of the sector. So that is why I must uh, thank Philip Capital and really congratulate them to initiate and organize this kind of conference. And I had in fact attended the first one I suppose in 2015. After that it really saw very good results. And so it continued. I am really very happy that it's organizing such kind of orga uh, conferences. Now, our basic theme and the specific area that we are talking about today is a very special, again, a niche segment of the entire uh, industry. That is a specialty chemical. Now, for that, we need to really understand the entire chemical and petrochemical industry, as well as the entire Indian economy. As far as Indian economy is concerned, I really need not talk much about it. Most of you must be knowing. And Indian economy is a very fundamentally strong, robust economy in the entire world. It, had, it has withstood in the past a lot of global turbulences. It has gone through a steady phase of development. Unlike other countries like China, now we are talking about China today, because in the last a decade or so, it grew very fast. Now, nobody knew really how far it was sustainable. That sustainability issue has cropped up. So they are again going through a turbulence. India always maintained a very steady growth rate. Whatever opportunities are coming up, leaving that aside, India always promised to grow very fast. And the future outlook is very good. And it is uh, supposed to be one of the most important economy in the coming decade or so. And it is the today at least the fastest growing economy in the world. And by 2025, Government of India is really working towards reaching $5 trillion economy. And out of that, about 25% we expect that the manufacturing sector should contribute. Out of that 25%, again, chemical and petrochemical is a very, very significant sector because it provides basic raw material to the entire other segments of the industry which are going, growing very, very fast. If you really look at the past picture of certain things, of certain uh, sectors like construction, packaging, consumer goods, automotive, textile, agriculture, healthcare, these are growing on its own at a very, very fast rate. These are the sectors to which this chemical sector is really feeding inputs. And Specialty chemical again is part of that which is really adding great value to smaller volumes of chemicals. This is a very, very specific premium segment as it was already mentioned and Indian strength in fact I will say lies in kind of specialty and knowledge chemicals because in bulk chemical which is basically based on global scale capacity, China was the leader, steel is the leader will continue to be the leader, I suppose. But the specialty segment where the India's strength lies is basically adding very high value, producing premium chemicals at a much higher and larger returns. Because equipped with very highly skilled manpower and further government of India is taking a lot of initiatives to produce highly skilled manpower to fit this particular sector. Whatever requires a lot of R&D effort, lot of knowledge base in those sectors we are already doing very good like take pesticides pharmaceuticals dye stuffs these are the broad specialty chemical areas where we are doing extremely good and we really need to take it further forward for growing at a very fast pace in addition to the basic fundamental demand drivers for the sector Government of India in the recent past has taken a large number of initiatives, most of you must be knowing, which are again further fueling the demand for the seg segment. 
like Make in India is a very, very big initiative of government of India. Under that, lot of initiatives have been taken. 100% FDI is allowed in this particular sector under automatic route. And you may not be knowing, India is very much short in natural resources like crude and uh, gas, which is one of the very, very basic intermediate supplier sector for the specialty chemical as well. Now, being that being the case, and in coming few years, about four to five years, we require about 40 to 50 billion worth of investment in this particular segment. That is the uh, upstream and the petrochemicals and intermediate suppliers. And large number of international players are very keen to invest in India in this particular segment, upstream and intermediate suppliers. A very big project has been already uh, announced uh, in Maharashtra state itself. Many of you may know, which is for about $45 billion petrochemical complex in the country. And there is a potential for another $50 billion in the next five years. This kind of investment is coming in the country and naturally that will fuel the growth of further downstream industries and automatically benefit them by providing cheaper intermediates and raw materials in the domestic country itself. So with that uh, scenario, I would like to uh, tell that in the past also the specialty chemical sector has delivered a very, very good return and in the future also there is a tremendous potential for this. And this is a high time for you to turn basically promoters of the sector than rather than only investing in the sector. Because promoters are also equally important for taking the sector forward. And there is, I don't know, that could be some amount of switching over from being a just invest equity investor to also promote this kind of industry. In our country, we have very big investment regions in the form of Paradip uh, PCPIR, then we have Vaisak, then we have Tamil Nadu. And Dahej is of course almost 100% full and they are going for expansion. So there is a tremendous potential to become promoter as well. And given the Chinese scenario now, there is much more potential to, for you to become promoter, have technology tie up with uh, Chinese players and set up the industry here. That will obviously provide you much higher return. So with that hope, I wish you all the best and look forward for a meaningful discussion during the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you to Philip Capital for inviting me uh, for this uh, conference. Uh, today, I just wanted to set the tone for the panel discussion we're going to have later on. Give some facts and figures which might be important for you to think about as you're thinking about investing in this space. Um, and lay out some questions as you should think about the investor companies. So we at BCG have been studying the sector extensively. Uh, three things that we are seeing here, and I'll give you a little more around this, but this really is the three messages uh, for you to take away. One is India in the specialty chemical side is leading the world in returns. Uh, and this is not hyperbole, it's actual facts, and I'm gonna show you some figures of the returns over the last few years. Second one is, in terms of the investment thesis, as you go back to your investment councils, as you go back to the places where the money is, uh, the investment thesis is very strong, very clear. The third is, as you think about investor companies, which is the companies that you're actually going to invest in, what you can do by bringing in capital is four big things. And each of those four things is an investment thesis for you as you think about investing in companies here. So I'm just going to go through these one by one. If you want. It's not working. Ah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, chemicals in India is surging. First off, globally chemicals is an attractive investment sector. This is the median what we call total shareholder returns, which is not only stock price, but stock price plus dividends, plus anything that you would make uh, as an investor in the company. 
globally chemicals has been for the past five years, if you take a five year average, the second most attractive sector worldwide to invest in apart from technology. This is not a small amount of returns, 17% annual return for the past five years on a median basis is actually fairly large. You will see it's larger than most of what we would think. We would think retail is interesting. We would think auto is interesting. Uh, chemicals worldwide has been really, really interesting. Within chemicals though, specialty chemicals has been at a very different level of returns and investment. So this actually is again a five year worldwide view of what the returns have been in the chemical sector. The base chemicals are all that you think about upstream. So for instance, upstream reliance as an example is base chemicals. All the petrochem derivatives, the first level derivatives, benzene, toluene, all of those are basic chemicals. Specialty chemicals is the one that we're going to discuss today uh, are all the chemicals which come downstream and much closer to the customer. And agrochemicals is all of the pesticides, herbicides, so on and so forth. So specialty chemicals has been leading returns for five years continuously now. It's not a flash in the pan, one year off thing. It's a 19% return year on year globally that we are looking at. It's important for us to understand what is specialty chemicals. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy term to throw about. Uh, there's no clear definition. Everyone has a different definition around it and the companies there. But essentially the way we think about it is if you are selling a base chemical, you are selling the chemical composition. So example, if you are selling common salt, right, the table salt which is there, you are selling sodium chloride. You are basically selling the chemical composition here. If you're selling a specialty chemical, you're saying I'm going to solve a problem for the customer. As an example, a specialty chemical could be an anti-dandruff ingredient in your PNG shampoos, right? So you're saying I'm going to give you a solution which will solve a dandruff problem for a customer and the chemical composition of it is by the way, right? So you're trying to say I'm going to sell, solve a solution for you, which by definition means you get higher returns and you're more closely tied to a customer. So as an example, if I'm doing an anti-dandruff shampoo solution for PNG, it also means that I've set up a tie-up with PNG for a long term for the platform, for head and shoulders as an example, which also means that I can continue to be on that platform for a longer time, right? So that's what we mean by specialty chemicals. I'll come back to the fact that it's not one uniform segment, just as you would know. India has been on a stellar trajectory. This was just last year, so 2017, this was the India chemicals any company listed greater than $500 million returns. We hit a 44% total shareholder return last year. The global chemicals average was 8%. So just to be clear on where we are as India versus the world, last year has been a stellar year uh, for us. This is not a flash in the pan. You take a five year view, we will be similar. Uh, there might be slight up and downs in terms of numbers, but this is not a flash in the pan. This is also not a number to be sneezed at from an investor point of view. This is real cash we're talking about here. It's not only that, it's about specific companies you can invest in. This is a list of the top 10 returns companies in the chemical sector worldwide whose market cap was between 500 million and 1 billion last year. Top 10 worldwide. Look at the number of Indian flags there. You've got six companies out of the top 10 last year which gave superior returns compared to any other company worldwide. This just tells you what the power of India is and what the returns have been over the past year, right? It's a, I'm sure a lot of us didn't realize how big India is and how powerful our returns uh, story is. This story shown to any investment committee has a very different discussion on India and its potential. I'm sure a lot of you have had discussions in the past saying, look, yeah, India has lots of potential, but it's not living up to it. This story tells you a very different story. This is six out of 10 just last year. It's going to continue on. There is no reason for it uh, to change uh, here. The question is why is this happening, right? So what is the investment thesis sitting behind all of these uh, chemical companies? The investment thesis starts with this. If you look at what our chemical consumption ratio is versus any country in the world which is more developed, quote unquote, there is a large difference. Our per capita consumption per, uh, uh, of chemicals per kg is nothing. You will see we at 86, uh, 86 euros per person. Uh, any other com country that you take, including China, Germany, etc., it's a 10 to 20 times upside which is there in terms of ability for customers to actually absorb this, right? So the investment thesis that there is a lot of upside, if you, if you stay the course, you will make a lot of money if you're in India, is clearly right. The second investment thesis is this. The reason that this is going to change is because the income pyramid is changing significantly here. Our India story is about consumption. It's about how much demand India can really generate. 
So this is actually the, uh, the income pyramid that you would see for India. This is in, in dollars, but you can talk about it in, any, in, 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 in any terms. So this is about, this is annual household income. And this is the number of households and percentage of households here. If you just see any household above this uh, threshold and any household above this threshold, this threshold is starting to talk about the, the really upper tier, the top 10% of India, the top 5% of India. This number was only 7% in 2010 of total households in India. Out of a total of 240 million households in India, only 7% earned above $15,000 a year. By 2025, this total number is going to be 16%. It's more than doubling in a space of about 15 years. This is not a small amount of change of wealth, capacity and ability to buy. The question is how does this translate into specialty chemicals? This is a good slide to show in terms of uh, uh, income, but what does it translate into? What it translates into is this. As people get more disposable income, they're looking to buy more premium products, getting used to a lifestyle which is more premium. To have more premium products, to have a better lifestyle, specialty chemicals is the key ingredient to make it happen. So across the board, wherever you look at it, if you want a better shampoo, as opposed to your normal shampoo, that's a specialty chemical ingredient sitting in that to give you a better shampoo. The premium shampoos, the premium household products, your premium cars, all of it is specialty chemicals in one way or the other, whether it's polymers all the way to uh, API ingredients. Let me give you some examples. So construction chemicals. So construction infrastructure is going to be a big driver of investment going forward. If you look at construction chemicals here again, every part of the house is going to change in the future. You're going to have taller towers. Uh, right now the metros and the tier one cities all have tall towers. Your tier two, tier three cities, if you've been visiting, also have started to build much taller towers. The 20, 30, 40 stories buildings are not unknown now in tier three, tier four cities. As you start to build taller towers, there is a pressure to build the taller towers faster, to hit slab cycles faster so that developers make more money and have lower working capital. To hit slab cycles faster, you need to have admixtures in the concrete, which allow the concrete to be expanded fast, to set fast, so on and so forth, so that you can run the slab cycles faster. All of that is specialty chemicals. You want better looking uh, buildings, you want more glass on the, on the buildings, you need more sealant for the glass, so that you don't have a, a weather condition where you actually are losing a lot of energy. That's specialty chemicals again. So every modern convenience that you think of, this hotel as an example, this auditorium, all of this is specialty chemicals sitting here. And this is just going to keep expanding as people get the money to be able to spend on these kind of discretionary items. Same thing on the nutraceutical side, and we talk a little bit in the panel discussion. Each one that you're seeing here, including the, uh, all of the revital supplements as an example, to fortified food, to dal with proteins, uh, to dal with proteins and vitamins and, and minerals, your Kellogg cereals, all of that is specialty chemicals, which are nutritional ingredients adding on to what is there. Your premium cars, exactly the same thing. You want good looking cars, you want lightweight cars, there's BS6 coming, all of that is all specialty chemicals sitting there. Light weighting of polymers, um, components which are sitting inside. Your paints, if you compare a paint on a car, a, a new, even a mid-range car, you take a Mahindra, Maruti, etc., a mid-range car right now, you take the paint and if you have a car which is at home which is 15 years old, just check the paint quality difference. Huge difference in paint quality. That's a specialty chemical sitting there. It's not the base paint uh, chemical sitting there, right? All of this is actually driving the demand. So if you think about it, your investment thesis is income levels are rising significantly. Consumption is going through the roof in India. As consumption goes through the roof and income levels rise, each part of the consumption has a specialty chemical ingredient to give a better lifestyle than they were living previously. However, this is not a uniform story. There are many, many different sub-segments in specialty chemicals. There's not one investment theory you can put. This is, at, this is at the high level 16 segments that we track. Within each of these, there are about four to five segments. So I'm talking between 40 and 80 sub-segments that you can invest in in India. Not all of them have the same story. Not all of them have the same mega trends going forward. So it's important to think about your sector which you're going to invest in and the nuances there uh, for yourself. So as, if I give you an example, Food and feed certainly very interesting. Foundry and mining not so interesting, right? Very different levels of mega trends and what you can push behind there. That's the investment thesis for you. Assuming that you invest in a in a company, what is your value creation thesis? What are you going to bring to the company with capital, which the company is already not doing on its own? Four things which the companies can do. One is 
you have to push the company to make markets. A lot of these chemicals people are not used to actually utilizing. Whoever goes out and makes the market by setting up uh, district wise go to market teams, so on and so forth, they are the ones who are going to make money and the market share. The second is digital. The use of digital in the value chain and manufacturing supply chain and customer access is critical. Companies lack the funds and the vision to do that right now. If you put in money, you have to push them and think you use digital and see how much money you can save there. Third is innovation. Is there a patenting IP portfolio that we have to do or tie up with others to do? And the fourth is what can you do on the premium product side? So in summary, A, India has been surging. Last year has been incredible, but that's just a symptom of five years of incredible run. So the facts that India might or might not be doing well in specialty chemicals, the facts are very clear. It's been doing incredibly well. Second, the value creation thesis for, or the investment thesis for India is consumption and premiumization of products and lifestyle. And the third is the value creation thesis for every company. There are at least four things that you will do with every investing, investing company that you do. And this is in some sense the setup for the panel discussion that we're going to have today. Okay. On that note, I'm going to hand over to Kai uh, to talk about the Chinese side of things. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yes, I can hear myself, and you can probably hear me too. Uh, yeah, thanks for, for having me here. Um, I don't quite know, I have a lot to talk about, so I, you need to probably push me a little bit when I'm, when I'm getting too, uh, too fascinated with, with, with my topic. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the aspects that, that are critical about the, the development in India is uh, to what extent can India take over business from China? And as it has been mentioned, there have been developments in, uh, in China that uh, particularly with regard to environmental regulation that uh, could be negative for China. And I'll talk a little bit about that to you today. Um, I think I've already received an introduction, so I'll just skip the, the parts here about my company, you'll see Brentuck is also on there just for you. That was in Brentuck, China, some project I did there. Um, and indeed, I, I usually tell people, I mean, usually uh, consultants need to play a lot of golf to, to be with their clients. I, I don't play golf, so I, I write papers instead, and then, and then I hope somebody, somebody hires me as a consultant for that. Um, I will give you two or three slides on the chemical industry in China, again, very quick because I have too much to talk about. Um, it's been a, a big growth story, 18% um, per year. 2004, by the way, is the year I came to China, so 18% on average every year after that in, in annual sales increase. And we also heard the figure 40% four, four of uh, China's, uh, of the global market share. Um, another thing is that if you look at the industry, and I'll, I can also uh, say that, or confirm that from, uh, from talking to people in China, from the multinational, uh, people still think China is a, a big part of the future of the global chemical industry. They think that it's very important for future growth for the industry. So, so far there's no real negative spirit about China among the multinationals. Um, this is sort of a slide that could be the introduction to, to a separate one-hour presentation. This is what I, when I t have to explain to people the characteristics of the Chinese chemical industry, I usually go through these 11 points. I just want to mention four that are relevant for us today. Of course, number two, the tightening of environmental regulation. Then number one, the strong government influence, which is important also in that context. And then we have two more that I want to highlight that the uh, chemical industry is highly fragmented and that there's overcapacity for many chemicals because of those, both these will later uh, turn out to be relevant for our specific topic. Uh, what's the rationale behind the whole tightening? Well, China is getting uh, more like a middle class, middle income company. People uh, worry not so much about where the food comes from, but how their kids are doing in school and, and are they healthy, etc. And my wife uh, 
it's got mentioned she's Chinese. She tells me things like, oh, Kai, the air is so bad here. Why don't we emigrate to Australia? So you, you get these typical uh, middle class uh, uh, concerns about the environment. And though China is not a democracy, I think what the government knows quite well, they have to justify their, their position as, as, as government. So whenever something reaches critical mass in terms of people are interested in the environment, then the government just picks it up before it gets, uh, uh, explodes in their, in their faces. And, and so that's what Xi Jinping has, has done. He has said the government, uh, the environment is very, very important and they've put it in the five-year plan, the, the 13th one, in a relatively major way. And uh, a key aspect there is to say chemical production should, should basically only happen in chemical parks. So that is from 2016 when less than half of the chemical production was in chemical parks to more than 90% in the next five, six years. And already it got mentioned there's a timetable for that. So it's relatively specific. It's not something where you can later get very wishy-washy about. The goals there are twofold. One is they really just want to reduce uh, the, the emission. They want to improve the environment. But they also want to control the chemical chem companies better. And one thing that is highlighted to me by Chinese industry participants, mostly they want to improve the industry structure. They now see maybe there is an area where you have 20 companies out of which only seven or eight are a little bit bigger. Uh, what, and, and you have maybe only 50 to 60 percent capacity utilization. So the government thinking is rather than do it in a, in a very sort of inelegant way as they do in steel or coal where they just say you shut down, they say, oh, we just create entry barriers. We say you, you can't pollute, you need to use this and this uh, emission standard. And by that way, out of these 20 companies, we can in an elegant way also uh, remove 10 or 12 from the picture without anybody really being, being able to be very, very negative about it because it's all done in the name of the environment. Um, yeah, so, so there are some other regulations that maybe are less relevant here, but uh, for example, uh, the Yangtze River, you've, you've probably all read about how polluted the Yangtze River is. So one of the measures there is to say no chemical production within one kilometer of the Yangtze River, even within chemical parks. So that has hit some of the chemical parks. They, they thought they still have a lot of space to, to uh, to uh, hand out and, and now they, had, they don't have. And there's also very specific individual regulations, just a few examples, like in, in Tianjin they say, oh, you can't use solvent-based uh, 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 coatings anymore if you want to repair cars, stuff like that. Um, another big thing, and of course we, 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 you need to think about comparative cost advantage, I guess it's somewhere here behind me as well. Um, the, the government has introduced an, an environmental tax which replaces something pre that was previously just some sort of fee. That has two implications. One, it's going to be higher. Uh, there's also going to be an incentive to be uh, less polluting. Um, the other thing is it's now controlled by the central government. And maybe that is the, the one thing that uh, I, I think I'll mention that again later. But China has always had sort of okay laws. It's just that the implementation was really bad. And now we are getting to a point where the government puts a lot more emphasis on implementing these, these regulations. Oh yeah, that's, that's the slide exactly. So as uh, it, it got mentioned, they have a, a huge army of inspectors. They visit uh, factories, they close them down. They say you cannot produce again before you've installed this and that. Uh, and it's, it's quite massive and it goes more or less from province to province. So I, I know some of you have this impression that specific targets are, are uh, specific segments are targeted. That's not really the case. It's more that specific segments like agrochemicals are located in specific provinces. So if this month Jiangsu province is the, t the main target of the inspections, then of course more agrochemical companies will be hit. And these inspections will continue t till April 2019. It's also, they might go on after that. So it's, uh, it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, and here, this is something I already mentioned. Uh, I just want to point this out that even in the official documents, you can find uh, this notation 
Uh, here is something from Fujian province where they talk about uh, where they talk about uh, uh, relocation. So they specifically say if there's a, if there are industries with weak market competitiveness and small companies, uh, then these companies should just close down and not, not relocate. So what's happening to the chemical companies? They are now uh, being hit by these unannounced inspections. Unannounced is important because previously often they were announced, so you just stopped production or, or cleaned up your, your, your act for, for a day or two. You have tighter regulation, you have the environmental tax, you have the requirement for relocation, and then this affects my, my chemical company in a number of ways. Uh, there's a lot of plant closures. Usually this is not, I mean, it's not like 100 are inspected and 50 are closed. It's more in the area of 10% or so. Um, but you see some examples here. And if you look at the overall number of chemical companies, it's been decreasing, which is, which is also a new in the, in the history of the Chinese chemical industry. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of companies will have to either relocate or stop production because they are simply not allowed. We heard about the timetable. Uh, we are simply not allowed to produce in the present location anymore. And depending on how big the company is, how important it is locally, the government may support this or they will just say, hey, you do it or you, or you die. Uh, the problem is that the chemical parks are running out of space and they are getting quite selective in who they let in their, their parks. So they will ask you, what are your emissions, what's your investment size, etc., etc. So a lot of companies will simply not find a way to relocate into chemical parks. But of course, we are talking here about, if I look at my previous 20 company sample, we are talking that those who will not find this uh, space are among the 10 smaller of those. So in terms of capacity, it will be, have a much lesser impact, a uh, much smaller impact. Um, then we have other things like you need to modify your plant or you need to reduce your capacity. If you run at full capacity, you just have emissions that are too high, so you need to reduce that. Oh, that was one too far. Um, and also it means there will be a shift to specific, uh, more environmentally friendly processes. You have a couple of examples there where, where you can make some basic chemicals by different processes and obviously what the government now will do is, is uh, when they uh, allow new production, they will be much uh, more inclined to allow it if you use the more environmentally friendly process. Often China has had non-environmentally fr friendly processes run for much longer than typically in Western uh, countries. And this is, I think, this, this all stuff that you, you probably know better than, than I do, uh, that, that, of course, as a result of, of these shortages and production close downs, there were, were sometimes dramatic uh, price uh, increases, for example, for caustic soda or for, for uh, dye stuff. From, from China. Um, then the question always that come, people always ask me is how does that affect company X, Y, Z? And then I usually tell them there's 30,000 uh, company, chemical companies in China, how should I know? Um, but that's, that's really a bit of an excuse. So what, what I can give them then is at least say, look at these factors and you have at least a rough idea, will your company be more affected or less? Um, so if the industry you're in has a low capacity utilization, that will speak against you. You're more likely to be closed down. If the chemical segment is more polluting and more low end, more mature textile chemicals rather than electronic chemicals, it's more likely. If your company is smaller, if your emissions are high, if you are in a very fragmented industry, if you Presumably, if you are located in the east, for example, in Shanghai, it's now very, very difficult to chemical product, do chemical production. If you move 200 kilometers inland, it's already getting easier because Shanghai has so many alternatives. They, they say, yeah, we're happy if you open an R&D center here, but we don't want your chemical production, frankly. Um, unprofitable companies, unlikely to, to be, be allowed. Uh, and of course, uh, technology, if the, the technology is outdated, it will also be more difficult. Uh, on an industry-wide level, uh, 
we already see that there is uh, some companies, Indian included, but here uh, some Japanese companies as an example, uh, that profit quite nicely from uh, reduced competition from, um, from uh, China. You can see the examples here. I'm, uh, usually when I listen to presentations, I hate it when somebody reads their presentations to me, so I more or less leave you the reading to you and just uh, talk over it. Um, the, the other thing is the consolidation of chemical segments. I mentioned this example with 20 and maybe only seven or eight uh, uh, remaining, and we see that in individual areas like sulfuric acid. And one uh, case example that was very interesting for me, I had a German chemical company, and they told me they produced some sort of specialty chemical, some chlorinated toluene derivatives, and they said they had a lot of inquiries from their customers. Could you deliver us more? We are having problems with our Chinese suppliers. There's gaps, there's price increases. And then they asked me, so, so what's behind that? Is that, is that going to be a long-term thing uh, or not? And I told them what consultants always say, like, you know, it depends, is what I said. Um, and then, then they, uh, of course, they asked, what does it depend on? Yeah, well, you need to tell me who your, are your biggest 10 competitors in China. And then they gave me those. Um, and then I looked those up individually and with, with my research team. So uh, it turned out, out of these 10 companies that were their competitors in 2017, six had stopped production in uh, mid-2018. So in, at least in this example, very significant share. The smaller ones, but okay, it's, these are probably the ones that have the lower quality product that, that undercut the prices, et cetera. And even also interestingly, we also asked these other four, are you thinking about expanding your capacity? At least in this case, they said no, because they feel at the moment the, the atmosphere is so scary about having all these inspections that you don't really want to dare and risk even more. And the, here's the, a bit the consequences. I already mentioned the, the uh, reduction in number of chemical companies. Sales, well, there's also other effects of oil price and whatnot that, that make it difficult to interpret whether these plus eight in, in sales are, are, are good or bad. But what's definitely interesting is that it has led to increased profits compared to the sales. So uh, the whole industry has gotten more profitable and that is, I think, is exactly what, what the government wanted. Um, which, which for India does not mean it's a bad thing. I mean, I'm, I'm now, I'm coming over here and, and uh, of course it's not my job to say, oh, China is all bad. I, I, that this would be suicidal from, my, from in terms of my job, but uh, it's, it's also not my feeling. But w what you see, if it gets more profitable, of course it should get easier for competitors in other countries to also compete in that area because uh, it seems there is a more discipline in pricing. They have realized it's better that prices are a bit higher. We also see uh, that, the, that the mindset of the Chinese chemical government and also the companies is changing. Uh, for me, a, a, a very surprising moment is I was listening, sometimes in Shanghai you have chemical parks uh, renting a venue like this and then presenting their case to chemical companies. Uh, and that, that was done by a park in Changzhou. And there was this guy standing, like, like me, standing here, and he said, oh, uh, I think in the first half year of 2018, we, we closed down 35 chemical companies in our chemical park. And I mean, the way he said it, it was not like uh, we hate, I mean, it was an advertising for his park. And that was really a very new development in, in terms of mindset because five years earlier, this would have something, that, I mean, you, you, even if they had done it, they wouldn't have mentioned it because it would have, they would think it reflects bad on them. Now they think it reflects positively on them. Um, and that brings opportunities for foreign companies, um, obviously because the, the, the costs go up in China, some of the capacity utilization goes up, the margins go up. Um, it more, may also, generally speaking, Chinese companies produce more for the local market. They, Chinese companies, except in specific areas like vitamin C or so, they are more, uh, most companies have maybe 10 to 30% uh, uh, exports. So 
first of all, they produce for the local market, so they might, even if, if there are capacity utilization, they might think it's easier just stay within the country. The, the exports are often more the icing on the cakes with somewhat higher margins, but also with a lot more trouble. Um, so uh, I think there should be uh, opportunities for Indian companies there, uh, particularly in those areas where, where China is not strategically not very interested in keeping them, which would be areas like dyes or low-end coatings, plastics, rubber additives, chlorine chemicals. Other areas I would not be so optimistic about is, for example, electronic chemicals, because even though that can also be quite polluting, it's seen as very strategic by the Chinese government, so they will do a lot to support that. Okay, and uh, I was asked to at least say a few words about the trade war. Um, at the moment, these 10% are not something that, that, that is very relevant to Chinese companies or hinders them a lot, but if the 25% are really enacted, which given the, the, the way uh, Trump's mind seems to be confused, uh, nobody of us can really predict whether that will happen or not. Uh, uh, it's, this will then be a, a, a big, big shock for these, and they will no, no longer be competitive, and they will, of course, try to export their way out to other markets. So conclusion, we have this, this kind of situation where we have both tightened environmental regulation and stricter implementation of this regulation, a couple of effects on the companies and then on the overall industry. Um, a few uh, conclusions there. My uh, strong conviction is it will stay like that. The, the environmental regulation will stay tight. They will not uh, go backwards just because GDP is uh, maybe 0.2% lower than, than the previous year. Um, and that means that we will have two other potential break points. This is 2020 when the small companies have to um, have moved and 2025 when the when the big ones have to uh, have to move, um, so I don't think this will will limit the the growth of the chemical industry as a whole. So far, I don't see negative impact. Actually, the mood among the MNCs they have good growth this year uh, is quite positive. So I think it will be more or less a thing where the the better chemical companies, both domestic and the MNCs, will actually benefit from that, from a better industry structure, from uh, nicer, nicer prices, but of course that also means there is going to be some opportunities for countries like India to, to step into these areas uh, and replace China to some extent. Thank you. Perfect. So, welcome everyone. Uh, I think we had a good start to the day in terms of context setting. We heard three things today. Uh, we heard what the government is doing. We heard what is a potential India story. We also heard what is a potential China story and the relative competitiveness between the two. Uh, maybe let's go in that order in terms of the panel discussion as well. I want to cover all three topics. I want to cover the government support topic. I want to cover the domestic consumption topic and get your views on that. And I want to cover the exports topic because that's a large topic and I also want to get our views on that. So starting with you, uh, Samiji, on the government side, every industry that we see worldwide on the chemical side has built up over time with government support. Literally every country has built up a lot of time over government support. Uh, India, obviously, we have got a lot of push there with the Make in India, etc. Uh, there is an announcement of a holistic chemicals policy which will come about. Uh, two questions there. One is, if you were to compare as an investor the amount of support and interest Indian government is giving its chemical sector versus other governments. What is your overall sense on where we will be pushing harder and where investors will benefit by investing in India because of the government support that we are getting? And the second one is where do you see the industry also needs to step up and work together with the government to drive up the competitiveness of India sector? So where do you want industry to support you a lot more on the initiatives that you are looking at? Uh, very good question. Actually, see, I mean, as far as government of India is concerned, in terms of facilitating the entire industry, there is a uh, industrial policy itself, which gives a lot of incentives. 
Now, if you come to really chemical uh, subsegment of that, chemical is basically totally uh, delicensed and decontrolled. There is no control at all, except a few regulations from the environmental side, and that you know is very very important for uh, growing on a sustainable basis. We have seen other examples like China is a glaring example. We have heard so much that they grew for last 10 years. Now they are on the hard job shut down. Of course, they are in the process of consolidation and it is going to jack up their price. What was the basic problem with Indian chemical segment is that so called cost of production was slightly on the higher side. That is how we really could not compete. That was a temporary phenomena, but it was a sustainable. So, we really should not uh, really do away with any environmental regulation. We have to take care of the mother earth and ensure that the future generation is safe enough. So, the most important aspect that government of India is trying to look into is to how to facilitate the growth of the industry. Because the investment has to come from the private side. It will depend on their techno-economic feasibility. And in that process, whatever bottlenecks are coming up, which are unjust must be removed and taken care of. So, towards that direction, there are multiple taxes. You must be knowing GST is a very big decision taken by government of India to combine multiple number of taxes into only single tax and everything is available on online. That will really bring a lot of transparency and make it much, much easier. What I suppose, I mean, we have looked at very global investors as well. What they look at is basically ease of doing business. That is the most important factor. In last few years, from 125, we have jumped up to 77th position by concerted effort of the various government departments and ministries. And on the top of that, even for every sub-segment, we are discussing with the industry associations what further can be done for the industry to facilitate and ensure that it grows much faster and really achieves its potential. So, that is at the national level. As you know, India is a federal country. There are a uh, good number of states and the industries are distributed in the states. They have their own regulations. Most again important is the environmental regulation. There could be some variations here and there. And again, in terms of incentive, the states also do provide incentives in terms of uh, interest uh, subsidy or uh, some other subsidy, they do provide that kind of incentives. So, I think good enough incentives are already existing. What industry needs to be is that they should be more aggressive setting up industry and taking some amount of risk. You know, there is tremendous potential. I mean, we are slightly risk averse. That is what I feel. I mean, is the situation in India today that we do too much of due diligence, too much of DPR, too much of return analysis. Whereas, if you look at China, there is so much of overcapacity. How this overcapacity came up? If you really had a proper DPR prepared, you can never have overcapacity because you have planned for meeting a certain demand in the market. So, see, I mean, they, how aggressively they went ahead, they reaped the benefit for a few years in the last decade or so. But we are too cautious and careful and risk averse. We go up to that, I mean, doing each and every risk analysis and then only take the investment decision. So, government is coming forward to facilitate you. You also need to take risk and re really be aggressive to take the benefit and advantage and opportunities that India provides. So, thank you for that. Uh, I, I just, that, so, that, there's Kylie, one, one thing I could directly comment on that. Uh, th this is actually in, in, in uh, China what you see why the MNCs have grown so much uh, slower than the private companies. Yeah. Because for a private company, it's like I see the market growing, so I double my capacity. If I'm a, a, a multinational, I think, oh, I go to my investment committee and then three years later, I'll increase my capacity by 20%. Yeah. And that's how they lost their market share. That's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so the, the two things I'm hearing you say, one is the government is supportive pushing hard on policy, but they are also being conscious of the fact that it should not be unsustainable development with ensuring that environmental regulations are in place so that we yeah. don't face the China situation yeah. five to ten years down the line. Yeah. The second ask that you have is from the industry and investors to have a higher risk appetite. Exactly. It doesn't mean over capacity, but it's still a higher risk appetite saying let's take the leap forward and, uh, and go there. Uh, yeah. from, from the industry, would you want to comment anything more on areas where you have been working with the government or things that you would want further support from the government? 
any Vivek? Yeah, in terms of environment regulations, as an industry, we definitely support, you know, we need to be a responsible industry, but uh, we need to somehow strike a balance. For example, we are not making any case that you should relax the norms, but the opportunities in the international markets are very short. So if we are allowed product changes without increasing the total pollution, then that could be something which can help the industry immediately. Because today if I have a license, you know, to utilize so much water or whatever, but if I change the product, I still need to go through a procedure. And then my customers may not wait for that. The second thing and which is more really a drastic measure is that for good companies, let's like say companies with responsible care logo or some criteria which government can define, there should be a self-declaration and automatic route for capacity expansion with of course penalties that if I expand my capacity with that route and then if I am found violating any norms, then of course I should be penalized. Now what it will ensure is that we are able to react to the market changes quickly, we are able to take advantage of the opportunities without compromising on the environmental uh, correct, correct. regulation. Yeah. So I mean, that is our I mean, request. As we rightly said, yes, I mean, he has been raising issues which are very common and very specific to agrochemicals like pesticide, then dye stuff <laughs> industries, very, very pertinent point he has raised. These issues are being discussed. I mean, this government of India has already addressed. Some of it are already in place. I mean, Chemexil chairman will be knowing that directives have been issued to the state governments to allow this product change, uh, product mix change to various states. But unfortunately, what is happening, states being independent in many ways, we have a federal structure again. I mean, in, the, in the areas where both the state and the central government have concurrent power, environment is such a concurrent uh, subject, where the states can as well legislate, can have their independent views and enforcement. But even in that, government of India has issued directive that will be really taken up for uh, enforcement and compliance. I mean, states have to be taken on board. They have to be also convinced. That is what is going to be done in very uh, shortly, in very one or two months or so. And as far as other issues are concerned, the Ministry of Environment is working very hard. We have taken a round of meetings with the industry associations on all the aspects. And next round, we will be really meeting the Secretary Environment and Secretary Chemical. There will be a meeting to sort out all the bottlenecks and the issues. And let me also tell you one another information is that Ministry of Environment itself is working on all these issues and you will soon resolve most of the problems. Fantastic. Satish please. See, I strongly feel that uh, recently when we had represented this, we came to know with that 2016 there was an amendment in the Environment Act that the product mix has been relaxed and the state has been given the authority. authority. But states are not acting. I have a submission that the government of India, the environment ministry should come with a proposal that you know today the industrial areas are working in the notified areas where we do have a common effluent treatment plant which has already been expanded to the large extent. Considering the common effluent treatment plant's capacities, a resolution or a notification should come that the notified industrial area does not require each and every industry a EC clearance. That will certainly boost the exports and the specialty chemicals also and the chemical industry. That's my submission because it's a time consuming. As you said, the opportunity is there today. If we do not encourage the opportunity within the next six months, we may miss the boat. Okay. So, am I? Am I audible? Yeah. So, uh, when you look at, let us say, China, China is a topic that we cannot get out of when we talk of the chemical industry. So, when you look at uh, China as a whole, you know, what is the value addition that they do? What comes in and what actually gets exported? The value addition is anywhere between the range of 30 to 40 percent. So, the fact remains that they don't do everything by themselves. It is a myth that, you know, they do everything by themselves and they're producing wonders in the world. No. There is a very, very clear and a very, very conducive import strategy as well, which supports the growth and the, uh, you know, the development <coughs> of the industries there. And also it is supplemented by an equally strong export strategy. So the entire ecosystem that has been developed in China 
facilitates that kind of a growth and that kind of a profitability. So there I think maybe uh, I am not saying that we are not doing enough. Yes, GST is a great step forward. It has made, you know, ease of businesses. It's helped consolidate a lot of, uh, you know, logistics uh, facilities and uh, everything else. But however, when you look at certain segments, for example, surfactants, lauryl alcohol is a, a feedstock for surfactants. It has an anti-dumping duty. But if you import the direct surfactant, you know, it's much more simpler. So now we have a beeline of surfactant manufacturers from, let us say, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia who use palm oil as a you know, basic. They are making a beeline into India because, you know, they are now uh, a lot more competitive. So s there are many such instances where, you know, we have to match the import strategy and the export strategy to create the right ecosystem for the industry to do uh, better. Fair. Perfect. So maybe now moving gears to the domestic opportunity side. So one of the aspects that we said in value creation is the consumption opportunity in India is so large that a company based out of India is almost sitting on a gold mine if they have got the right business model. The question which a lot of investors have had over time is this we have been saying for two, three years now. The industry always has had potential, but we always have challenges. There's been technology challenges, manufacturing challenges, scale challenges. Uh, maybe starting with you, uh, Vivek, uh, how do you see that changing going forward from an industry point of view? What is that? Is there going to be a magic lever which is going to fundamentally change it? Are we going to suddenly start seeing scale? What is going to happen which then investors can also change a little bit saying now it's really going to explode from an industry point of view? No, frankly, I don't think there is any magic which is going to happen. We can't expect that, you know, next month onwards or next quarter onwards, things will change dramatically. I think, you know, what is important is for long-term sustainability or competitiveness or growth of any economy, industry, company. Productivity is one of the key drivers. Innovation is another one. Now, if you look at uh, the productivity increase in India and in China, you know, in India over the last 10 years, the productivity increase, CAGR is about close to 6%, China is 7.9%. So that's very good numbers compared to the developed economies, which is, let's say, 1%, 2%. But if you look at the absolute numbers, the developed world, uh, the labor uh, productivity would be eight times, typically eight times that of India. So we need to bridge that gap. And unless we bridge that gap, I mean, if we are going to rely on problems of China, trade war of US and China, now these are opportunities which are short term, which are not sustainable. So if I base my strategy assuming that I'll get anti-dumping duty, I assume that, you know, Trump will uh, create problems for China, I assume that Chinese companies will not overcome their pollution problems in the coming times. Then, of course, that's a recipe for disaster. Then if I, you know, if anyone invests in those kind of companies, that's not going to be sustainable. Coming more specifically to the chemical industry, we all talk about agrochemicals, pharma, dyes as the potential opportunities. But if you look at uh, the intermediates, there are many intermediates which are not available in India or not available in sufficient quantities or we are not competitive and we are critically dependent on China for many of these intermediates. Now, it's a kind of a chicken and egg situation that I find it cheaper or I used to at least find it cheaper six months back to import from China. So I do a detailed DPR and you know, <laughs> there's no case to put up those capacities. That's where probably we need to, you know, work closely with the government. We need some support from the government. And unless we build our intermediates industry, then really we are at the mercy of the Chinese intermediate manufacturers and they could, you know, create problems for us. You look at basic building blocks, like for example, methanol. Now methanol India is a huge net importer of methanol. There's really no additional capacity coming up. Methanol is important even as a blend in the fuel and with our crude oil imports and all that, it's very critical. So Niti Aayog, has announced that, you know, they'll support uh, methanol manufacturing from bio waste and so on. But industry and government together need to move in that direction. Otherwise, you know, it will only be talk and nothing will happen on the ground. Of course, I mean, I'm not saying that if these things don't happen, the industry will not grow because you look at the consumption numbers, you look at the demographics, you look at the internal strengths. Government has really done a lot in terms of improving the infrastructure, improving the ease of doing business. In global innovative index, in logistics index, we are doing much better. So the growth will definitely be there, but that can accelerate if 
you know, such small bottlenecks are taken care of. Yeah, I mean, he's perfectly fine. I'd just like to add two things to that point. Please. This is the right time for us to really go in for intermediates. So far, we are dependent on very cheap intermediates from China. And that is not going to be the case anymore. I mean, it was very amply, clearly explained that why it was low, cho low cost and now it is no more uh, possible to continue further. So this is high time that we must go into intermediates. But as a institutional investors in the equity, I don't know how, what kind of role really can you play. That is why I am suggesting that one of you, I mean many of you, whoever is having a lot of uh, strength in chemicals can turn into becoming a promoter. I mean, enter into intermediate segment, enter into, I mean, some uh, building block segment. All these things are highly uh, future potential. I mean, that will bring in new units altogether in the country. That will add a lot of value also and also uh, make the economy grow. And as far as innovation is concerned, I would like to add to this that specialty chemical, as he rightly pointed out, is nothing but R&D nothing but research and development, where India has got tremendous infrastructure in the form of CSIR labs, very good, well-equipped CSIR labs we have all across the country. If you turn a promoter or you want to invest in R&D, you can develop some kind of uh, understanding with these CSIR labs and really work on these areas which will positively bring you a lot of profits and return in the future. Balu, uh, you look at a very different set of the specialty chemicals industry, uh, more the ingredients side, the flavors and fragrances side, etc. What's your view on that side uh, in terms of consumption outlook going forward? Um, and is there going to be a hockey stick going to happen now? What is really going to change in the next five years? Are you seeing this kind of trend going forward? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, when you look at uh, you know most of these segment specialty uh, product like you say uh, depend on the functionality and the value that they can deliver. <coughs> so obviously it's going to be a differentiated product which will you know be slightly higher price than the regular product that you will probably see in the market. Now <coughs> when you look at the uh, newer generation it's not just about the disposable income it's also about the spending habits. Uh, these days not many are putting you know you you would earlier save for a rainy day. Today your rainy day is probably a credit card. You spend today and you pay it, you know, much uh, later. So the spending habits of the, you know, the uh, population is changing. Now this definitely allows for more differentiated products to, you know, uh, come in. And this is where specialty ingredients does play a very, very important role. If you look at food, how is it that you get, you know, food of your choice all across the country? It's because of innovation. It's because of the specialty chemicals that are uh, coming in. The, the, the specialty chemicals are not only in, let us say, these products, but even in the packaging part. How is it that you can get a right packaging which improves shelf life and also gives you, you know, a more economic way of transporting metal from one place to another in an efficient way. So all those innovations are possible only with specialty uh, ingredients. So the innovation is definitely driven by uh, specialty ingredients. And uh, given the spending habits of the population that we see now, there is expected to be a very high growth in, in, in especially in the differentiated products. Of course, uh, this also needs to be supported with, uh, you know, uh, the right communication and marketing efforts. And that's where we see the bottleneck in being able to communicate to different sets of population. So having a product which suits pan India is a big challenge. Yes, you'll have a product which suits a particular region, a taste of a particular region or a preferences of a particular region, but then yes, with you know, with newer uh, you know ingredients coming in, the the success rate of specialty ingredients has definitely gone up, and we expect to see that progress even further. Maybe uh, a question to all three industry participants here, uh, Sajji, Balu, uh, Vivek. If you looked at the at the companies who have done very very well in terms of return, you have the larger companies. <coughs> you have the DCM Shrirams, you have the Atuls, you have the PIs, you have the UPLs. These all are large companies the investment opportunity for them in some sense has matured. I mean, they've already generated a lot of returns. So uh, if you look at the rest of the industry, there are a lot of small and mid-cap, unlisted, promoter-driven companies, promoter-owned companies 
who either are already delivering these kind of returns to the promoters or can potentially deliver these kind of returns to investors with the right kind of capital. The challenge is for investors to go out and locate these kinds of companies. What is the next Atul, next RC, next DCM, so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question for all three of you. What are the kinds of things that investors should be looking for in these kinds of companies? What are the sparks that they should look for to say, okay, if I put money against this company, this is the right kind of company and there's a good chance that they will have great returns in India. So if you think about, let's say, the top three investment opportunities in your mind, what kind of opportunities should they be looking for? Not specific companies, but what kinds of opportunities are they uh, are they looking for? Uh, Sadeji, we'll be starting with you. See, let me tell you, the Indian chemical exports today is roughly around about 160 billion. And uh, specialty chemical is 20 percent of it. If you see, the specialty chemical growth is almost around 9 percent per annum going. And the chemical exports are also going 9 percent. By 2025, we expect to have the chemical exports to 300 billion. So certainly there is an opportunity. The Indian entrepreneur is a, a very skilled, hard-working entrepreneur, knows how to overcome all the challenges. And there are a lot of potential markets such as US, Europe, Latin America. Presently, the India is the third largest chemical manufacturer in Asia. And if you see globally, we are the sixth position. There are a lot of opportunities today we have because of the Chinese slowdown and uh, the US trade war. These are the two aspects. And the growth, specialty chemical, if you see in all the sectors, everywhere there is a growth for specialty chemical. And if properly being financed and properly being handled with the policies by government, I'm sure this sector will grow like anything. And at the moment, many of the companies are going for the modernization, doing collaborations. And I'm sure you will see the results within the next few years that this sector and this chemical industry will go. Well, yeah, uh, considering that, you know, specialty chemicals depends on uh, disposable and the differentiated spending habits, uh, there are three sectors which come to mind. One is, of course, the health and wellness. Uh, when you say health and wellness, it should not be confused with food. It is a crossover between food and pharma, which is more, you know, when we say, you know, uh, what do we say, proactive health uh, management. Uh, and it also includes a crossover between cosmeceuticals, uh, so nutraceuticals, uh, my apologies, pharma and cosmetics, which is termed as cosmeceuticals. So this health and wellness is definitely an area which is expected to see very high growth. Uh, second area would uh, definitely be personal care. Uh, when you look at personal care, yes, uh, it is uh, a lot to do with a discretionary spending that comes in. It's not just about buying a shampoo or a soap, which we do for our everyday basis. But when you move ahead in terms of, let's say, skin care, when you move ahead in, in differentiated hair care, when you move ahead, you know, in terms of many other uh, categories, deodorants, uh, leave-ons and, you know, spray-ons and everything, that is another area which, which is a very, very attractive uh, segment. And the third area that I would, uh, which we cannot ignore in a population of 1.3 billion is definitely food. Currently, our, depending on how you define the market, we are in very, very low single digits of processed food uh, consumption. And processed food consumption should not be mistaken for non-nutritious food, no. Processed food has a lot of advantages. For example, it helps reduce the wastage. I was driving through Dadar when I reached this place and the market is over. Truckloads of leftover uh, food, uh, I mean vegetable and fruits are being carted out. Food processing can prevent that. It can help reach many other, you know, uh, locations from where it's actually being uh, manufactured. So definitely food is another uh, large area that uh, should be looked at, see that. Thank you. Vivek? No, I believe that, you know, you can find right opportunities to invest for the long term in almost every sector. So it's a question of choosing the right companies and not so much of the sector. And on a lighter note, I don't know why you think that, you know, companies who have done well so far <laughs> will not, you know, continue to do well. Uh, that's one. And second is that, you know, as an investor, if I were to, you know, define some criteria, I would look at whether the, I mean, of course, owners have to have the right credentials but whether they are globally competitive because, okay, we might be producing for the Indian market, 
but going forward the trade barriers are going to come down and you know import export will become easy so unless you are competitive at a global scale on your own strengths i mean if you are depending on import duties or some such barriers to trade i don't think okay today we are talking about more localization compared to globalization but i don't think that we should invest in anything which is not globally competitive we should also look for sustainability because i mean okay you might make profits in the short term but if you are not taking care of the sustainability part and particularly this environment so any promoter who is investing in innovation anyone who is investing in sustainability and who can be globally competitive without barriers to trade i would think that you know one must invest in those kind of companies mm. interesting interesting i think with please sorry please see i strongly feel that today our exports which are taking place if you see 45 to 50% of the exports are coming from the mid segment and the small scale sector the mid segment is has a tremendous opportunities and they are looking for the expansion and today with the current scenario with the banks they are difficult to get the fund but the investor can stress upon the mid segment i am sure the mid segment will do better in the future and they can give you better returns as far as the investment is concerned interesting i think maybe just building on that rajiv maybe starting with you and then we can go to the rest of the panel one of the things that we have seen over time is the reason indian entrepreneurs are so successful is because of the entrepreneurial energy of the promoter themselves they are the one driving force behind the organization in a lot of cases they are the ones who actually know the technology or are able to spot the next set of molecules to be innovated on as an investor coming in that also means that i have a high dependence on the promoter to continue to be there as part of the organization and highly driving it there in some cases that may or may not be there in some cases promoters might be looking to exit the organization as well as part of an investment strategy how should they think about it how are promoters in india thinking about professionalization of their organizations to make it more dependent any thoughts there see uh, as i i i do also come from the mid segment we always had a thought that the mid segment we do not want outside investments which will control the mid segment ourselves the mid segment has always sent their children abroad for studies they have come up it is becoming difficult for the mid segment the second generation to continue the business at the moment but i still find the opportunity in the mid segment because the mid segment has finally understood the growth depends upon the finance and the low cost of money which would come to the industry and the higher cost of the bank should be returned back and i am sure the mid segment in the next 5 years you will see will do the best and there is a great opportunity for the mid segment as per the chemical and the the specialty chemical is concerned i want to say one more thing i have been personally going to china for a couple of years 25 years i have traveled in china the chinese growth is also second because of the finance given by the chinese government to the institutes like you know the universities whereas we have lot of universities here who are asking for money but the government is not giving them the money i am sure if government gives incentive not to the manufacturer we don't want incentive from the government as far as exports are concerned but these incentives whatever we are doing exports 1% or 2% of that is given to the universities for the research i am sure this research will help to the mid segment and the small scale segment and in return the government exports and the specialty will grow that's my submission uh just one last comment for you ramesh ji and then we can go to the exports guy i want to come to you on that one uh as you think about the point that satish uh, he made about the fact that mid segment and some of the even small segment companies are actually some of the drivers of growth and engine and certainly from an investment point of view they are starting to be more attractive are there different ways the government would think about in terms of policies regulations and support for the small and mid segment to grow both overall and particularly in specialty chemicals any thoughts uh, there see mid segment has always been area of focus for the government right from beginning why mid even below that micro segment also has been the focus because this is a sector which i mean what to mr wax said rightly this is a segment which drives the growth this is a segment which basically provides employment 
very large scale uh, segments are basically capital intensive employing very few laborers. So that is why the main focus has always been on the mid segment. And there are a large number of support which are given by government to the mid segment. Right from public procurement, there is a reservation now. And at present, government of India has taken a very initial, I mean very uh, concerted 100 day program to ensure that the finance flows to the mid segment immediately, that 59 uh, minutes loan. The government of India has launched this program to be implemented for 100 days, ensuring that whoever needs capital from the bank should be disbursed in 59 minutes of application. That is number one. In terms of public procurement, 25% reservation is given to this mid-segment and all kind of facilitations are and support is given to the mid-segment. So the main focus has always been right from beginning, the mid-segment. Okay, there are other lacunas I mean, which has to be resolved by the segment itself. If those are resolved, if they come forward to take the benefit of the government support provided, I am sure, I mean, we are going to do really, I mean, uh, great miracle. Fantastic. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, maybe moving on to exports, which is our last uh, discussion item. And there, uh, Kai and Satish, I am going to start with you and then I am going to, the rest, going to go to the rest of the pa panelists. Uh, the stereotypical image of the India versus China export battle has always been China high scale, low cost, India higher quality, slightly higher cost, but certainly lower cost than Europe. That is the very stereotypical image that investors would have. Currently, everything is changing there. Cost structure of China is uh, changing, as uh, Kai was saying. Our quality levels are changing, and our scale levels are changing here. If our objective is to start substituting European and US supply into their markets by an Indian supply there, what do you think are the value props for an Indian company to be supplying there? How would a European or an Indian or a, or a US company buying material specialty chemicals from India, why would they go to India to buy it? So what is the, what is our unique value prop there and maybe it differs by some of the segments you look at, but it would be useful to hear a comparison between India and China, technology, scale, etc. Your point of view, Satyajit? See, I will strongly say that the Indian policies which government of India has and you see after making India programs, we have sustainable policy and rules regulations. The supplier who is supplying at the moment to Europe and US has gained the confidence by those countries. You see today what has happened. Because I am already in the business, I am seeing that suddenly China has stopped supplying to these markets like US and Europe. So the buyers in these areas like US, Europe, Latin America has absolutely lost the faith in China today. because. In the past, they were not looking for a second source. Now, suddenly, stoppage of the intermediates and other things, these countries are looking India as an emergent manufacturing hub because Indians are strong as per the chemistry is concerned. They are hardworking and they are very strong and sustainable, sustainable in supplying to these markets. So, I strongly feel that these are the main factors. There are some small few, th few things which this sector will overcome. You see within next three, four months, six months, there is going to be a massive change because everybody wants to take the opportunity of the present market situation. They are trying to expand. Finance was a hurdle. Finance is also, they are solving government. Some issues were the hurdles, but I am very happy that the present government is very much helping the industry, trying to give reliefs in so many cases because as we have been talking with the chemical ministry, I should thank them. Uh, instead of environment, chemical ministry has been taking lots of issues of ours in the last two months with the environment ministry. Many of the issues have been, uh, have been taken up. Uh, so many issues were there, but now we have seen 10, 12 issues they will solve. And I'm sure in 2009, you will see the opportunity Everybody is moving towards the growth of their own organization and the economy will grow and the exports of this country will grow. Kai, your point of view, uh, seeing again China versus India, mainly in the export side. So if I'm a European or an American company looking for a supplier and I'm evaluating China versus India, the stereotype earlier 10 years ago was obvious. What is it now? How is it different now? Well, 
my, my, I mean, I, I can mostly give you the, the, the impression for, for, for China. China is still not very good at uh, supplying variety, at supplying small volumes of customized, sophisticated products. So this, this would be, for me, the area for, for India to go in. I, I think the, the typical Chinese plant manager would ideally produce exactly one product and sell it at the exit of his plant and not give any service, not give any customization, uh, ideally not even talk to the customer. So, so that, that's where I think the, the opportunity would lie for, for India. Okay. And maybe just building on that before I get to the mm -hmm. rest of the panelists, for both of you again, on the specialty chemical side, the R&D formulation knowledge is critical. Maybe the fundamental R&D is still done by scale companies like the BASFs of the world, but formulation knowledge and application knowledge uh, R&D is critical to even grow here. Are you seeing a shift on Indian promoters starting to focus a lot more on that side, maybe investing more capabilities in India getting better? And is China changing a little bit on how they are viewed technologically worldwide? So maybe starting with you, Satishji. See, as, as I told you, if you need a growth, you need a research and development. I have seen in the mid-segment mid also today people have started investing. And as I told you that today if you really want to grow, we should gear up our old institute like, you know, IITs, VGTI, Institute of Science. These are the areas, these are the universities who have really helped us in long term. And these institutes are looking for the funds because the funds are not coming from anybody. So government of India, my request would be government of India should fund them in long term, seeing that the next 10 years the industry will do better, the returns will come better as far as the exports are concerned and these institutes will certainly deliver. That's my focus and I, I, I will strongly say that the government should look at these universities and they should take the advantage of it. I, mean, uh, I perfectly agree, I'll add again to that. See, government is having a large number of institutions. One such institution is directly under our uh, department in the ministry. That is, uh, that is the Institute for Formulation Technology. That was working in the field of pesticide formulation technology. From 90s onwards, it has developed about 60 technologies and transferred it to the industry. That time it was relevant. This institution was set up by UNDP in the past along with the same institution at Nantong, somewhere in China. That institution has grown very big. Why it grew big? But this institution remained as quite a small institution still now. Is uh, What is the reason? We try to look into that basically. Now the government, if you say specialty chemical, how many products will be there to take up for research? There will be at least 1000 I suppose. Now, what areas are required to be taken up for research, who will tell us, who will tell the government? Government itself cannot do research. There are institutions. So, whatever is upcoming, promising the investors or the industry has to come forward and have some kind of collaborative approach. You cannot say, let the government invest the money and do some research out of that, whatever is beneficial in the future, I will pick up those and invest. That is not the right approach. You have to work together in a collaborative mode. You come together, have an alliance, have some MOU, invest some money, government also will chip in money, whatever is required. If you have that kind of collaborative approach, I am still open and very much ready to open up this institution, make it much bigger and take up whatever R&D you, uh, you want. I am openly telling you today here. Fantastic. Kai, your point of view on the technology RD, IP yeah. side of China? Well, I, I mean, uh, gut feeling f from my side, and, and I, I am based in China, so I, I, I am presumably slightly uh, favoring China, but if I was a, a Western company, I would much rather do my R&D. If it's high end, if it's really not development, I'd much rather do it in India than in China yeah. uh, for, for two reasons. One is the whole intellectual property thing, which I think is, is better here, and, and yeah. I'm not so worried about the Chinese government sort of trying to favor the, the local company next door. Uh, the other is sheer in, in, in terms of 
qualification of the individuals in doing R&D. I mean, you, you were at Berkeley, I was at Berkeley doing a postdoc there and just comparing Indian uh, guys doing a postdoc next to me and the Chinese guys. And I think, I mean, it, this is, is now a little bit stereotyping, but I'd, I'd rather, if I, I would rather give my R&D work to the typical Indian guy than the typical Chinese guy. Super. Uh, moving on to the industry side. So, uh, Balu, you are part of an MNC. Uh, Vivek Atul has a large international business. So both of you are very familiar with what's happening in the world and the relative competitiveness. Your views on India versus China, how it is being viewed and where are the different sources of competitiveness changing currently? And maybe you can speak about your specific subsectors or areas you're more familiar with in the specialty chemicals industry side. So maybe Balu, starting with you on the uh, F and F, uh, which is flavors and fragrances or ingredients side. Thoughts on India versus China? Sure. Uh, uh, there is no doubt that you know, specialty ingredients require a lot of innovation. So you have to be constantly innovating to be able to differentiate. So there, uh, if you look at <coughs> the number of patents that are being filed in certain segments, China is second only to the US. Not all of them are being used at this point of time. But nobody will spend money on patents just for the heck of it. At some point of time, they will come and hit the market. So they are preparing themselves for a regime where they will move out of these commoditized products into more specialized uh, products. Just look at, you know, let us say, there's a lot of talk going on about the electric uh, cars. Yes. The largest market for electric cars that is expected is. to be China. It is already. Yeah. So uh, they're already investing a lot into battery technology, you know, and, and you know, making it more efficient and easily rechargeable. That requires a lot of innovation on the materials being used and everything else. Same way, if you look at, let us say, the food products that are available in China, they are probably 10 or 15 years ahead of what uh, India is at this point of time. They have a food product for everything. It's probably, you know, if you walk into a supermarket, it's like walking into a drugstore. There is something for hair fall, there is something for young skin, there is something for, you know, bone health. So, they're, they're, you know, they've innovated far higher and they've moved far ahead in the market than in India. But then, yes, if you look at the intellectual property or, you know, the kind of people that we have and the kind of... Um, uh, you know, educational institution and the kind of mindset that Indians come up with, definitely we have the capacity to innovate. We definitely have the capacity to differentiate. It is just that the scale currently is missing. You have an innovative product, but you cannot bring it to scale. And the second part is the finances that are being available to an entrepreneur. As you uh, mentioned, the entire, you know, the innovation and the R&D and the knowledge rests with the uh, entrepreneur. So if you invest and if you take over a company, the key, the key or the critical point is to be able to retain the existing uh, talent and also be able to scale it up. Okay. And scaling up of the operations is one of the biggest challenges that uh, the, the medium scale industry do face in uh, uh, India. So yes, there is a lot of capability, there is a lot of potential, but then yes, at this point of time, I think uh, a lot more investment needs to be done. And as uh, rightly put, it has to be a collaboration between exactly. both the industry yeah. and the government because the industry has the feel of the market. The feel of the consumer is with the industry. And of course, yeah. the government does support in terms of, you know, uh, how you treat certain elements and the cost aspects of R&D in your balance sheet and the breaks that you get. But a lot more can be done. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opportunity there. Perfect. Very good. Yeah, I certainly feel that uh, international buyers today are much more, you know, willing to buy from India, prefer buying from India because they want to spread their risk. No one wants to depend only on China given the current situation over there. There's a big renewed interest, you know, in investing in India even by the multinational companies or let's say foreign companies including China. There are a number of companies which want to, they do not want to expand anymore in China. They want to diversify their production base. They want to come to India because of the inherent advantages as well as spreading the risk. So we certainly see export opportunities really growing exponentially in the future. Now coming to what we can do, I mean, we certainly should, you know, take advantage of this sudden shift of interest to India, but we need to be closer to the customer. We need to have, let's say, stock points, I mean, these are very basic things in, let's say, in Europe, in USA. But apart from that, we need to develop the technical, you know, support or the product uh, information. We need to be seen as someone 
who protects intellectual property rights, someone who is willing to invest in R&D, someone who is willing to go to close to the customer and solve their technical problems. And I think many Indian companies are working in that direction. So certainly exports, currently, you know, we have export share of 2%, 3% for products like inorganic chemicals, organic chemicals, dye stuffs, and so on. That can certainly go to maybe if not 10% can double, triple the share in the export market of India. So we certainly see very interesting opportunities in exports. Perfect. Uh, just exactly building on that, moving to the flavor of the month. Uh, trade wars, tariffs, uh, the anti-globalization, at least feeling that people are getting, policies are getting put in place. Uh, a big driver of value creation of specialty chemicals over the past few years, at least for the larger companies, has been exports and the ability to substitute high cost, uh, high quality by lower cost, high quality products. As an investor, if I'm going to be investing in an Indian company, I will be having some part of my investment thesis about what is the export potential out of India from this company. What should I be worried about as I think about this investment thesis for an Indian company from an export point of view? And what mitigating factors are there as I think about it? Where, where are we already secure and where are we exposed to risk just from all of the uncertainty in, in the global market? Satyajit, maybe starting with you. See, presently, I, I really uh, see the whatever the situation in the industry, the present policies, the tariff barriers and all are boosting our exports. There is, I don't see any problem at the moment with the industry. Certain areas where the Ministry of Environment come one step ahead and uh, as I told you that uh, we have lots of chemical industrial areas like China we have parks, we have the industrial areas which are almost 30-40 year old industrial areas which are already geared up as per their common effluent treatment plants. They have expanded. They are looking for an expansions, but we have certain hurdles about the environment clearance, etc., which is not speedily done. I am strongly, last week I have recommended the government of India, the Ministry of Commerce and the Chemical Ministry, you should remove the 5F itself from the notified area. This is hurting the growth of our uh, our industry. If you remove 5F from the notified area, I am sure everybody is ready with the expansion because last 2-3 months I have travelled, lot of questions and answers are asked by the Ministry of Commerce to boost the export product areas, countries. I strongly said it is not required because whenever I meet the industry, he says I am very happy, I got 6 months orders in my hand. This is the situation last 2 months I am saying. So I am sure the industry will grow much faster and with much growth if the Ministry of Environment should come up with removing 5F. Interesting. So you are saying the global trade dynamics which are playing out now are actually being favourable to India and, yes. and that is helping us. So maybe your point of view on the global trade dynamics and the specialty chemicals industry in India? See, global trade dynamics are always, I mean, transient phenomena. Right now what is happening between USA and China? I mean, everybody is keen in India that we must take best opportunity of, out of it, make uh, basically best use out of it and really ensure, I mean, uh, people say that there is a lot of enquiries from US parties. I mean, yesterday only we had a meeting of the industry associations. All US parties are making a lot of enquiries with Indian companies. There are opportunities opening up and we must take advantage of that. But uh, as such, that cannot be a permanent basis of our competitiveness. I mean, it was already told. This could be a transient phenomena. I mean, you don't know how long it is going to last. Neither US nor China, I think, can uh, really afford to continue this for a long time. I don't know. I mean, there are also other uh, issues that in China there are a lot of hidden subsidies, a lot of uh, cost-cutting activities which are not really acceptable or in line with the WTO requirements. But India, we don't have all those kinds of situations. So we are basically fundamentally strong to go ahead. Regarding regulations and all, see again and again, I will try to, I mean, point, raise this point again. The environment should not be polluted to that extent that it becomes difficult for us to live. In Delhi, you don't know what is the level of pollution. Maybe the people from Bombay are not really realizing 
In Delhi, it is a very, very serious and uh, alarming state of affairs. I mean, breathing itself becomes a problem. The SPM uh, is very high. In China, you have seen Shanghai and all cities facing uh, in the winters. What was the situation created? I mean, if that is the situation, people will spend more money on health care and going to the doctor than purchasing our uh, goods. So, Perfect. in a way, that is going to be counterproductive for the industry itself. That is how it is not sustainable. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so, on a trade front, whatever liberalization or whatever issues require streamlining, that is also going on, equally on equal footing. In the past, uh, some many FTAs were executed. Due to that, somewhere here and there, some aberrations could be there. Now, there is no way out really to correct those. Until unless there is a strong review, both the countries have to agree to review that kind of FTA, you know. And you have to give some other benefit or concession in lieu of taking out something. So, this is not all that easy. Fantastic. Okay. So, I am so yeah. hearing from both of you, one, uh, the current trade war is beneficial to us. Yeah. Second one is it's transient. You never know one, yeah. one year from now what's going to be the trade war and who it's going to be with. Kai, you had, you had that one image of US and China crates fighting against each other. Uh, what's your view? Uh, is it currently a longer term phenomenon? Is it going to be India plus beneficial? Is it India beneficial in the short term? What is your sense? Well, I'm, I'm afraid it is, at least as long as Trump is president, it's going to be a longer, longer term issue. Um, and you, you might have realized I don't like him very much. So, um, As far as opportunity to India, I'd be a bit careful about that because it also means China will have more pressure to export to other markets. So that, that could work both ways. Uh, overall, I think for China, it's actually manageable e either way, at least for the chemical industry. Uh, Baru Vivek, any thoughts? Sure. Uh, as uh, Kai said, you know, the capacity, one of his points he mentioned in the presentation was that there is a lot of overcapacity and the old technology is dying out. So obviously newer technologies are more efficient and there is overcapacity. So with the barriers being very high of exporting into the largest market which is the US, obviously there will be other places and as uh, we understand, India is one of the focus markets for China these days. So definitely you can see a lot of imports that will come into uh, China. That is an opportunity because if we are able to get lower priced feedstocks, our opportunity to value add is uh, definitely higher. Okay. Brentag operates in about 74 countries across the globe. And we have an organization within an organization known as a global sourcing organization. So the role of that organization is to be able to source material efficiently and send it to other countries for sale. So within that uh, space, China definitely is number one, but the large, uh, there's a large amount of focus and the number two slot is India. So India is definitely a very, very attractive place to source material. Lot of advantages in India. One, of course, there is transparency. You know, what you see or what you see about the competitiveness is based on the free market. Whereas in the China, it's a, it's a yes. different, uh, you know, uh, dynamic that plays out there. And of course, like I said, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are able to innovate and are able to deliver, you know, uh, products efficiently, more cost competitiveness and, you know, a lot of new products also that uh, most of the markets require. Just to take you one, uh, one example of a product, for example, castor oil. Castor oil, uh, the derivatives of castor oil is used in many applications and in India is one of the largest, you know, uh, producers of those derivatives. But when Brentag looks at sourcing castor oil derivatives, we would like to work with four or five companies. Why? One, because most of them are owner driven. What is the sustainability or the continuity of those industries is a challenge. Secondly, the scalability. You know, Brentag is a big organization. We are about you know, 13 billion euros globally. So the first question that comes from a developed market is how much can they supply? That is always a barrier because their scaling up is a challenge. So if they have the capacity to scale up, then of course we can work strategically with a few suppliers and be able to invest, the, invest with them and you know, grow the market for them in uh, other countries. But then yes, India is definitely a very, very attractive source to, you know, to source material, not just in any one particular in the, in a category, but in a wide variety of uh, uh, industries. So Thank you.
I entirely agree with Mr. Vaad that the current external environment like the trade war or the global situation is a big advantage for India. Now the point is that you and I cannot control, forget about knowing, but we cannot control about what is going to happen in the future. So whether China-US trade war will come to an end, what will some other countries do? So the way to look at it is really, I mean, I cannot say that if the trade, you know, environment is detrimental to India. So what we need to do is we need to build various scenarios, assuming that, okay, the trade war, you know, continues, assuming crude oil prices crash, assuming crude oil prices go up. And we need to be ready with our strategy or our actions if that event happens. Because if I wait for that event to happen and then I start thinking about what should be my reaction, then obviously, you know, I will be not in a good position. So the way to look at it is today it's wearable, so what am I going to do today in the short term? Tomorrow if it changes in an adverse manner, what am I going to do? So the industry needs to be ready with those kind of, you know, proactive decisions, proactive planning, rather than, you know, trying to just say that, okay, I cannot control anything. Fantastic. So, uh, I had to say one. Sorry. See, uh, I just want to say you, as far as the competitiveness of the industry from India, let me tell you, today also many of you and everybody knows that China still subsidizes 13% cash incentive against exports. We have the proofs, we have everything in our act. We just get 1%. One and a half percent from the government. But still you can understand, we are still competitive, only we have failed in our side is the large scale of expansion of our product. Mm -hmm. If we would have done large scale capacity building, I am sure we are competitive against China. This is my submission for the investors to help the mid scale and the small scale, which are going to be the boost giving industries as far as the future exports are concerned. Good. Uh, maybe we can throw it open to the audience for questions. Uh, is, is there a mic yeah. uh, somewhere here? Hello. Yeah, a question for Mr. Gadre. Uh, yeah, here. Sorry, Mr. Gadre, uh, what has yeah. Atul done differently? Uh, you've created a lot of shareholder wealth. So in terms of strategy, product selection, etc., what have you done differently last five years or ten years? And any suggestions for the broader Indian specialty chemical sector based on your own strategy? You know, I'm afraid I will not be able to discuss uh, company-specific uh, things over here. This is not the right forum for that. Maybe you can contact our secretarial department. And I already, you know, expressed my views about how the chemical industry can grow, what are the opportunities. So I'm sorry I will not, you know, be able to answer any specific questions about the company. Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, Yeah, thank you. like the polluting industries or areas which require more customization or where sensitivity to intellectual and property rights is higher. However, if I were to take Vivek's point saying that India needs to be more product, uh, uh, needs to be more glo globally competitive even while competing in the, in the domestic market, I, I suspect that there is a huge productivity gap between India and China. If that is indeed so, are there any steps that we are taking to bridge that gap and how would we go about bridging that gap if we wanted to be globally competitive and hit this 10%, 15% export share that we are talking about? So these questions are really addressed to the two of you or anyone else in the panel. They have done in comparative studies? Productivity. No, the labor productivity in China today, I mean, I don't have the data for chemical industry, but in general, it is about 60% higher than India. So, of course, I mean, one can look at it as a problem, one can look at it as an opportunity that it's that much easier for me to improve. 
So we, really every specific company, every company has to work on that. And government is also supporting a lot. For example, if you look at logistics today, you know, Indian logistics cost as a percentage of GDP is very high compared to, let's say, US. So I always used to wonder that, you know, if I take material, let's say, from my factory to Delhi for a full truck load, the transportation cost is not high compared to the US or anywhere else. Where it matters is that today, you know, because of the reliability or the time taken, unreliability or the time taken for transportation, I build warehouses, let's say, at 10 different places. And then I keep stocks. So that's all a cost. That's a logistics cost. But if there is, you know, if my goods reach from, let's say, Bombay to Delhi in two days, instead of unknown time, then I can reduce the warehousing, I can reduce my inventories, and I can improve the logistics. So that is the way the productivity will improve. So it's a combination of what an individual company would do within things which are in their control and what happens to the infrastructure. For example, the port infrastructure. Now today it might be taking X number of days. So I have to plan for that. Of course, things have improved significantly, but compared to let's say Singapore or Dubai, we still are inefficient. So once these kind of things will improve, then naturally the productivity of the companies and of India as a country would grow. How about labor productivity specifically? What would you do to bridge the gap? Because that is under your control, right? Yes, of course. I mean, the way for that is automation, digitization. Digitization is one very big way in which you can improve the labor productivity. And it's not a question of reducing the labor itself. Because anything which a man does is prone to, let's say, errors. Anyone can make mistakes. But a robo or a computer or you know a system would not make a mistake. So it improves the consistency, it improves the quality, improves the reliability, and it improves the productivity. So that is what companies would do: digitization or automation. Uh, uh, I, I could maybe add one thing. I, I had some Indian uh, company visit me in in, in uh, Shanghai, and they told me about one product they they are interested in and. Uh, the way they explained it to me, and, and you remember the 40 to 2 percent, so it's, it's kind of a similar relation. They said there's 20 companies in China producing this, this chemical, and each of these chemical companies has a capacity that is equal to India's annual demand. Uh, so there you, you have some economies of scale that you can't, I mean, that's just there. It's very difficult to, to, to change that from the current situation. Uh, hi. The back. Uh, yeah, this is Pranav from Rare Enterprises. I have some questions for uh, everybody of you. Uh, so Amit, you said that, so I, I will just finish my questions. Each one of you, please uh, remember your own questions. Why don't we go one question at a time? Okay, so Amit, uh, first question for you. You said that market making is one of the critical skills for picking up a great value creation. So can you give us with examples, specific examples without taking obviously your client's name? Uh, what is a market making? What sure. are the components of it? Sure. So let me, uh, every market making exercise is different by sector. Let's take examples, for instance, in construction chemicals, the one that I showed there. Uh, currently, construction practices across India are very, very different. There's no standardization. A lot of it is not concrete based. It's a, a lot of it is literally uh, jelly based, steel based, etc. right? Now, companies who have to go out and educate people on the fact that you need to use concrete administers in your buildings, and this is the advantage that you need to do, that is actually the market making that is required for them to start adopting it. The challenge is that you need to move people, as an example in this case, from a mindset of rupees per kg to, go to a total cost of ownership, which is what is the total cost of actually creating the building, which, needs, which means you need to have people on the ground uh, who are working with masons, working, uh, working with architects, working with individual house builders, to actually tell them what is the different construction practice and why that is there. Uh, there are multi, mul multiple examples across the world in India of companies who have individual regional field forces who do application technology saying construction in Cherapunji versus construction in Rajasthan is going to be very different because of the moisture levels and humidity levels. So they customize products for that. They work with architects there. And then they use digital with the advance of 4G. They use a lot of digital to actually help drive this growth. So when you're looking at companies for value creation, you can see are there patterns where they have been able to do this or are they always second and third commerce where someone has already created the market and they're just going as another competitor there. The, 
the first kind of company will always get higher market share, higher profitability, higher sustainability. So look for those kinds of companies when you're looking at investing. Uh, okay, so this was consumer sector specific, but uh, is, do you have any industrial uh, chemical it's, specific? It's similar. All of it finally ends up in the consumer side, right? Does the consumer demand picks it up? So even, for instance, better glass, PMMA glass is an example. That has to be consumer driven first and then the industry picks it up. So okay. always it starts with the consumer. Okay, uh, so I have a couple of questions for uh, Vivek. Uh, Vivek, you said that there has to be a globally competitiveness rather than the temporary factors like trade war and, you know, capacity shutdowns, which can reverse. So can you just explain specifically what are those global competitiveness in your term? Is it process re-engineering? Is it feedstock cost? Is it uh, anything else? Is it capital cost? No, basically, a company can only control, I mean, I cannot control the interest rates in India. I, can on, I cannot control the feedstock costs. I can only control the processing part. If I am able to process, let's say, raw material A to finish product B in the most efficient way, then that is where I will be globally competitive. Because I can always access capital, I can always access, you know, these feedstocks globally from wherever they are cheap. I can, so I, if my process is efficient, then I will be a winner in the global market. Right. So I, I would like to just combine that with what... Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Kai said that probably the companies who can make customized products for their uh, global customers could win in India. So are these two not opposing each other? Because if you go on re-engineering a process and, you know, mastering an economy of scale in some process, you could be probably at the other end of spectrum where you need to be a very agile in developing small customized chemicals for your customers you need to define which market you are going to compete in. Are you going to compete in specialty chemicals, smaller volumes, closer to the customer, tailor-made products, or are you going to, you know, be in bulk commodities? And obviously the drivers there would be different. So I was referring more to the specialty chemicals that, you know, if you are closer to the customer, if you are processing not only the within your plant, but also how a customer uses it. And if you are able to explain the advantages to him, then that's where you are globally competitive. The okay. root of competitiveness, what I understand is basically innovation. Innovation does not mean scientific R&D alone. Innovation means marketing innovation as well. It innovating the product, differentiate, differentiating your product slightly differently from your competitors, differentiating your technology to reduce cost by a marginal amount. Marketing, each and every area there is a scope for innovation and that is the way to really stay competitive and this is a continuous process okay so that brings me to so sorry, preci if, precisely if, if to i might if i might just say yeah. i'm very conscious of time as well we only have yeah. about five minutes left i want to give questions to the rest of the audience maybe you can catch up with the panelists one-on-one -on -one post this sorry there's a question here as well uh, the question is on uh, the basic uh, material side uh, feedstock or rm whichever way you say uh, there was a comment that uh, local capacities have not scaled up and we were importing a lot of it. So last three, four years, if you see, we never had the cost-led pressure. So there was a tailwind kind of a thing. Uh, so the manufacturers, let's say the company who use the RM, uh, how do you see the, you know, uh, the, the shape up incrementally? Because sporadically in few uh, industries, let's say a, a fluorochemistry, we have seen fluor spar shooting up or in methanol chemistry you have seen methanol shooting up. So the, the spreads or the gross margins have started shrinking. Now this has happened off lately. So how does the company view it this particular scenario and you know is it here to stay? Then what happens is incrementally for some time we are actually in a headwind scenario. Uh, how does uh, the industry uh, body thinks uh, to rectify the whole situation? And, uh, you know, what's the thought process uh, from uh, China uh, over this? Because it just started and it's slightly sporadic in few industries. It doesn't happen that, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, a rule elsewhere. See, the fluctuations in the input prices and the fluctuations in the market, I mean, the finished goods prices will always be there. The spread between finished goods and raw materials is never constant in any commodity. I mean, even if you take basic things like let's say benzene and naphtha or toluene and naphtha or any chemicals 
the spread would change because the driver of the raw material is different than the driver of the finished goods. So these kind of fluctuations will happen. And sometimes, you know, the spread will increase, sometimes the spread will decrease. The trick is if you are better than your competition, then you remain in the business, you sustain. The first ones to go out will be the weakest players. And as long as, you know, you have someone weaker than you, then you survive and then you remain in the business for better days because nothing is there, perm there is nothing permanent. Like the margins would shrink, sometimes the margins will go up as well. So the trick is you have to be strong enough to sustain the bad times. Actually, let's put it this way. Uh, last three years, we internally utilized all our capacities on FGs and finished good side. And uh, we also got benefits because China capacities kept shutting. So there was shoot up of prices on the finished good side. Now the reverse is happening. Uh, so is it a case incrementally to be thought of? Uh, because a lot of those raw materials actually come imported into the country. Uh, so is it a case, uh, so it's not temporary because three, four years we are in serious tailwind. Uh, is it a serious headwind because locally we are not uh, tuned to have those kinds of capacities. Locally we do not have supplies. No, my take is that, you know, the boom time which we had, for example, chemical prices, some of them went up three times, four times. So that those days are certainly over, but then we are not looking at a situation where the Chinese prices again come down to their original levels. So the Chinese finished goods prices would be somewhere between what they were at their peak and what they were at the bottom. So we need to plan for or we need to, you know, reckon with those kind of, that kind of a scenario. Because if I assume that, you know, during the peak shortage, and like you rightly said, you know, the peak shortage may be, you know, behind us. So we cannot assume that the peak price would continue forever. But we should not, you know, think that the bottom price is again going to come back very soon. Because like they said, you know, everyone said over here that China pollution, China labor, China behavior is certainly adding to their costs. So we are looking at something which is more sustainable on a more, you know, long term basis. So in the, so, sorry, in the interest of time, we might have to just close the discussion. So maybe one final thought from the participants, participants before we close the panel. I am uh, going to my investment committee to present the case for uh, investment in a specialty chemical company in India. What's the one line uh, that or one point I absolutely should make about this which will convince my investment committee? So what should I remember about all of the discussion that we had today that I should go back to my investment committee and say this is why specialty chemicals in India we should invest? Starting with you, Vivek. Basically, it's the market. I mean, the consumers are here. The economy is growing. The demographics is in our favor. Unlike China or Japan or the developed world, the future of the mar the future is here. So obviously, every company should be investing where the market is. Perfect. And that perfect. Thank you, Bal. Uh, so, when you look at the specialty, uh, uh, you know, uh, ingredients or specialty chemicals, it's not about price. It's not about you know saying that oh we'll have to benchmark it against a certain price. It's about what functionality it brings to the end product. What is the benefit it gives to the end, pro, you know, to the end product? I could have given an example, but uh, you know, time is uh, short. So it's about having the, you know, uh, having being the capacity to innovate and to bring in new, new, uh, new ingredients and newer products, for which I think India is definitely well poised. One, because of the inherent demand that is present in India, we need specialty products because it's a very, very underdeveloped market as of now. And secondly. As uh, I mentioned earlier, India is being viewed as an export hub. It is it has been viewed as a good place to source a uh, lot of material, and of course, it makes a very attractive case uh, for investment into specialty chemicals. So, Kai, <laughs> yeah, just more or less repeat the same. So demand, word. demand, and exports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's a good idea to invest in specialty chemicals in India. A because people need more specialty chemicals at the, as they get richer and uh, specialty chemicals is R&D intensive, which I think India does well. Interesting. Samiji? As I have already uh, told that, I mean, you should basically try to invest in company which is having a very big innovation or research uh, plan. That will take you forward, stay competitive, and grow further. That is the most important area of the entire specialty chemical. See, entrepreneurs have a talent to deliver the product with the confidence, with the sustainability. That's what 
I have to say. Super. All right. Thank you all. Thank you for the panelists. Uh, thank you for a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just, one, just one second. So uh, as we close the session, I would like to thank uh, all our panelists for uh, taking time out and uh, for the sheer knowledge that was shared today. Uh, I would now request uh, my colleague Zareen to uh, present uh, a moment for uh, each one of them. Uh, first, Mr. Samir Vishwas. Dr. Kai. Mr. Satish Vag. Mr. Vivek Gadre. Balakrishna, and last but not least, Mr. Ramit Gandhi for his contributions today. Thank you, thank you, everyone, and uh, we can now break for lunch and rest of the sessions, please. Thank you.